Giza, Egypt, 1928. A professor of archaeology and his daughter arrive at the excavation site. The local foreman, overwhelmed by a storm of positive emotions, shows the discovery to the chief, a round plate with lots of hieroglyphs never seen before. While the professor's daughter admires the found medallion with the symbol of Ra, the workers lift a huge hula hoop with the same symbols as on the discovered plate. The professor is amazed at the finding, which resembles some kind of high-tech device of enormous size. 66 years later, the professor's now elderly daughter comes to a symposium on ancient Egypt. Dr. Daniel Jackson presents in front of the scholarly community. He furiously tries to prove that the Great Pyramid was built long before the Fourth Dynasty of the Pharaohs. However, the entire audience is outraged by such claims. Well, who do you think built the pyramids? I don't have any idea who built them. Men from Atlantis? <laughs> or Martians, perhaps? <laughs> His theory is perceived by the audience as nonsense, and the audience hurriedly leaves the presentation. Upon leaving the building, he is approached by an unknown man who asks him to follow him to the car. That very Catherine Langford, the professor's daughter, is already waiting for Daniel in the car. She is already aware of all the details of Dr. Daniel's life from the detailed dossier. The woman offers the guy a job to decipher ancient Egyptian writings. Daniel tries to refuse, but Catherine convinces him to think about the offer. I, I'm going to go. Well, when? <laughs> I mean, you've just been evicted from your apartment. Your grants have run out. Everything you own are in those two bags. Want to prove that your theories are right? This is your chance. Some time later, two military men come to the retired colonel, Jonathan O'Neill. The man is heartbroken over the death of his son, who accidentally wounded himself when playing with a gun. The military men report to O'Neill that he has been reinstated to duty. The next day, Daniel arrives at the military research center, which is organized in a former nuclear missile silo. He is met by a group of scientists who showed the doctor the plate found 66 years ago in Giza. Amazed by what the doctor sees, he has explained that the plate depicts hitherto unseen hieroglyphs. Those aren't hieroglyphics. Might be some form of hieratic, or maybe cuneiform. Daniel's task is to decipher their meaning. As a professor of archaeology, he immediately finds inaccuracies in the interpretation of some of the inscriptions. Well, this should read, A million years into the sky is Ra, sun god, sealed and buried for all time. It's not door to heaven. Is Stargate. Now he understands why the military is interested in 5,000-year-old Egyptian tablets. But the colonel enters and corrects the scientist, saying that the analysis showed the age of the discovery to be 10,000 years. This figure 10,000 is ludicrous. I mean, the Egyptian culture didn't even exist. Yeah, we know. But the sonic and radiocarbon tests are conclusive. The colonel is appointed head of the project, and all information from this moment has become classified and literally every decision must be coordinated with the colonel. Well, these are cover stones. Was there a tomb underneath? No, 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 no. Something a lot more interesting. Excuse me. This information has become classified. Two weeks later, Daniel is still unsuccessfully trying to unravel the meaning of the unknown symbols. They lack a logical sequence, and the writing itself does not resemble any known ancient language. However, when he goes to get an extra cup of coffee in the middle of the night, he notices an image of the Orion constellation on the guard's newspaper. Shamelessly snatching the newspaper sheet from the military man, he compares the image to the writings and realizes that all the symbols are just constellations. An emergency meeting is convened for the occasion. Daniel reports the result of his research. The symbols are coordinates for space travel. The military men are amazed that just in two weeks the guy managed to decipher the meaning, which other scientists were struggling with for two years. But to chart a course, you need a point of origin. Except... There's only six symbols in the cartouche. Well, the seventh actually isn't inside the cartouche. It's just below it here. The colonel gives permission to show Daniel what was behind the cover stone. Finally, he sees that very discovery. What is that? It's your stargate. The gate is made of a mineral that doesn't exist on planet Earth. A team of technicians inputs the data decoded by the scientist into the computer, then the sequence of symbols from the cover stone. Daniel manages to immediately decipher the main symbol, meaning the point of origin, planet Earth. 
which is depicted on the gate in a slightly different way compared to the cover stone. General West, Jackson has identified the seventh symbol. Thanks to this, the group of specialists successfully activates the gate. A huge vortex is formed in the center of the gate, after which its surface becomes more stable. The military men launch a drone with a bunch of sensors through the gate. The drone crosses the gate and before it shuts down, it manages to transmit its location. It's in another galaxy. The beam has locked itself onto a point somewhere in, in the Kalium galaxy. Having analyzed the atmospheric data, scientists come to the conclusion that the atmosphere on the other side of the gate is absolutely identical to the Earth's. The drone managed to transmit an image of part of the Stargate from the other side. There are completely different symbols on it. The military men intend to study the symbols first and then continue the mission. But Daniel, overexcited by their success, assures them that he will be able to decipher them if he gets to the other side. Are you sure? Positive. After much consideration, the military men assign a team with equipment to investigate a gate into another galaxy. Daniel takes with him a pile of literature devoted to the study of Egyptian civilization. Catherine gives him a medallion with the Ross symbol found 66 years ago. I found it with Stargate when I was a child. It has brought me luck. You can bring it back to me. The technicians launch the gate, and the group with all the equipment goes through the portal. After the teleportation, people get covered in hoarfrost. Upon recovering from disorientation, the group walks through an ancient corridor and finds themselves in the middle of the desert on an unknown planet. The structure where the gate is located on this planet is an exact replica of the Great Pyramid of Giza. While the military men gather data about the area, Daniel circles around the structure looking for information. The colonel commands everyone to wrap up and head back to Earth. Wrap this up, get everybody back inside. I want all you people back through the Stargate within the hour. You're coming with us, aren't you, Colonel? Sir? But Daniel informs them that in order to decipher the symbols and to launch the Stargate from this side, he needs a cover stone, like the one they have on Earth. Your job here is to realign the Stargate. Can you do that or not? I can't. You can't or you won't. I can decipher the symbols on the Stargate, but I need an order of alignment. Now, those coordinates were marked on tablets back on Earth, and there must be something like that here. I just need to find it. <laughs> Everyone is puzzled with the fact that Daniel didn't warn them about this before traveling to another planet. One of the military men pushes the scientist in anger, saying, You're a lying son of a b**** You didn't say a word about finding anything! The colonel calms the soldier down. Back at the camp, one of the soldiers starts to bully the scientist again for his negligence. At this time, the colonel activates the atomic bomb. His assistant arrives, and the colonel hastily hides the explosive device from him, which means that out of the whole group, only Colonel O'Neill knows about the bomb. He has some separate task in secret from all members of the expedition. Meanwhile, Daniel sat down to eat a snack among the dunes, and his eyes fall on mysterious footprints in the sand. He sets out to investigate them and finds a huge animal in harness that looks like an earth ox. Daniel sees that the animal got interested in his Fifth Avenue candy bar, but the military men who have arrived there too warn him. I wouldn't feed that thing. It's got a harness. By patting the animal, Daniel unknowingly commands it to run away. His foot got hooked in the reins, and the beast dragged him for several alien miles to some primitive settlement. Walski, well, please. Noticing the symbol of Ra on one of the strangers, the natives immediately fell to their knees before them. The military men take a sample of the mineral extracted by the natives with a special device. The analysis shows that it is the same mineral from which the Stargate is made. The head of the settlement comes out and tries to communicate with the strangers, but they don't understand the language. I can't make it out. Sounds familiar. A bit like Berber. The natives greet strangers with a drink. In return, Daniel treats the leader to the Fifth Avenue candy bar. Delighted by the taste of the bar, the elder invites the strangers into the town. In the middle of the town hangs the symbol of Ra, whom all the inhabitants worship as the only god. The colonel realizes to what they owe such a warm welcome. A strong sandstorm begins, and all the inhabitants hide in their homes. The remaining military men back in the camp try to contact the colonel by radio, but the natural disaster creates strong radio interference, so they have to take shelter in the pyramid. In the evening, the locals feed the strangers with local delicacies. The colonel suggests that since they have one Egyptian symbol, they may know the Egyptian writing. Daniel tries to write his question in the sand, but the elder erases the hieroglyph 
in fear and in panic, orders everyone to turn away. What the hell's going on? It seems like writing is forbidden to them. He orders the women to take Daniel away. They wash the guy in the tent, after which the girl he liked earlier walks in. Without further ado, she gets down to business, but the embarrassed scientist asks her not to undress. He wants to kick her out, but sees the elder immediately start to lash out at her at the entrance. Thank, thank you. I want to. I'm very, I'm very happy. Thank you. Then he tries to just socialize with the local hottie. He learns that her name is Shauri. He again attempts to communicate by writing. Despite the fact that she is obviously frightened by the forbidden writing, the girl eventually writes back a symbol representing the planet Earth. The scientist asks her to take him to the place where she saw this symbol. Meanwhile, the soldiers in the pyramid unsuccessfully try to contact their colleagues in the settlement. A giant starship, which caused that sandstorm and radio interference, appears above the pyramid. It covers the structure like a dome. All the military men inside are attacked by an unknown creature with advanced plasma weapons. The creature is clad in technological armor reminiscent of an Egyptian deity. The girl takes Daniel to a cave inscribed with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Her pronunciation of all the hieroglyphs differs significantly from what Daniel knows. This is actually why he didn't understand their language. Nature? Nature? The girl teaches the scientist the correct pronunciation. In the meantime, the colonel barely managed to explain to the local teenagers that he needs to find Daniel. One of them gives the scientist's jacket to his pet to pick up the trail. Thanks to this, the colonel finds the professor with a girl. Daniel has already mastered the rules of pronunciation. The only difficulty was in vowels. He tells the colonel that, according to the wall writings, the history of civilization on this planet began with a star traveler who escaped from his dying planet in order to extend his own life. His body was decaying from old age, and he traveled the galaxies to cheat death. He came to Earth where he encountered primitive race. The traveler realized that he could prolong his life in a human body. So he took possession of the body of a young boy. Having acquired human form, he proclaimed himself a god. He used the Stargate to bring thousands of people to this planet to slave labor in the mines to extract the mineral that is the basis of his technology. With this mineral, he could live forever. The people on Earth revolted when they realized who he really was and the Stargate was buried. Fearing that the miners would rebel on this planet too, he outlawed reading and writing. In this cave, they find a cover stone with a set of Earth coordinates. But unfortunately, the last symbol denoting this planet, the point of origin, is destroyed. And without it, they can open a gate to an unknown destination. It's worn off. I can't make it work without the seventh symbol. Meanwhile, the only surviving soldier from the pyramid is dragged to that very Ra, who recovers his body in a special sarcophagus. The four men leave the settlement and head to their camp near the pyramid. Daniel reluctantly says goodbye to his new girlfriend. A group of teenagers from the settlement sneakily follow them. The men notice the ship above the pyramid. What the hell is that? They sneak inside the pyramid and discover abandoned equipment. A local guardian appears and shoots the two military men with his plasma staff. All of this is being watched through a window by the teenagers from the settlement. The colonel and the scientist descend to the gate, where O'Neill immediately attempts to activate the atomic bomb. However, he discovers that the bomb is gone. A hatch opens, from which another guardian descends from the pyramid ship by teleport. Eventually, the colonel and the scientist are surrounded by several guards, and they surrender. Put it down, Jackson. They are taken to the ship, the interior of which resembles a pharaoh's palace. Ra appears in front of them, surrounded by children. They bring the bomb the colonel was looking for. Ra thinks they have come to destroy him. He orders his guards to remove their masks. Underneath, they turn out to be ordinary people. Ra himself is still in the body of the same young boy he took possession of several thousand years ago. The colonel snatches the staff from one of the guards, and a gunfight ensues, during which Daniel is killed. The children cover Ra with their own bodies, making it impossible for the colonel to fire. He is immediately knocked out by another guard. Ra notices a medallion with his symbol on Daniel's chest. The colonel is dumped into a pit, where he meets three other surviving soldiers in some liquid. While the teens from the settlement investigate the abandoned weapons in the military camp, 
two strike fighters fly out of the spaceship. As a punishment for helping the strangers, the strike fighters shoot up the settlement. Many locals are killed. Teenagers come running into the settlement. The elder tells his son that Ra punished them for helping the strangers, and he regrets it. Daniel regains consciousness in Ra's recreational sarcophagus. There is no trace of the wound left on his body. Ra admits to him that he chose the human race because human bodies are easy to recover. He has studied the books Daniel took with him and is impressed by the technological advances that have taken place during his absence on Earth, but the inhabitants of Earth are now a danger to him, so he intends to send the atomic bomb with his mineral back to Earth. The mineral will increase the bomb's power a hundredfold. He needs Daniel to execute his friends in public in front of the locals with his own hands to prove that Ra is their one god. Meanwhile, Daniel's girlfriend takes the teenagers to the cave with writings. She tells everyone there what the professor told her about who Ra really is, according to these writings, where their people came from, and how humans evolved on Earth thanks to being free. The next day, Ra summons all the inhabitants for a public execution. A guard hands a staff to the professor. Daniel points the staff at the military men, while the guys from the settlement give him a sign that they are ready to fight. Daniel turns around, tosses his staff up, and shoots at Ra. A brawl ensues, during which the Earthlings manage to blend in with the crowd. Despite heavy casualties during the escape, the Earthlings and the natives celebrate their small victory in the evening. Everyone present is ready to go into battle against Ra and his fighters. Although the colonel is the only one against the idea, because he knows firsthand how dangerous it is to trust children with weapons. Why don't you just tell him everything? Why don't you tell him about the bomb? What's he talking about? The colonel admits that his mission was to send the group back to Earth, but to stay on this planet and destroy the Stargate on this side if he sees any danger. Well, your bomb is his now. And tomorrow he's going to send it back to Earth, along with a shipment of that mineral they mine here. And when that thing goes off, it's going to cause an explosion a hundred times more destructive than that bomb alone is capable. The guards report to Ra that they have failed to locate the escapees. Ra executes one of his soldiers in anger. At the camp, the children laugh at Daniel, who is trying to cook dinner. They say, husbands don't do this work. Daniel realizes that the night Shori came to him was the night of their wedding. However, the guy is happy about such a turn of events. He approaches the girl and kisses her. After carnal pleasures, the professor notices the elder's son drawing the symbol of their planet on the wall. Daniel realizes that this is the symbol lost on the cover stone, marking the point of origin. What are you doing? I found it. What are you talking about? The seventh sim? We're going home. The next day at the quarry, the military men kill a guard. The elder tries to stop his son, but the young man is unwilling to live as a slave. The elder then begins to pray to earn his god's forgiveness. Daniel calls out to the elder and shows him the true face of their gods. All the slaves rise from their knees, and the earthlings with a bunch of teenagers go to the Pyramid of Ra. Disguised as slaves, delivering the mineral to the pyramid, the soldiers and children make their way inside the pyramid. How you doing? Where a firefight ensues. The gate to the pyramid slams shut, and some of the attackers are left outside under fire from the stormtroopers. Ra orders his fighter to immediately send a bomb to Earth. At this time, the colonel activates the bomb to finish his mission. I thought we agreed to dismantle the gate on the other side. And you will. That's your job now. I'm gonna stay here, make sure this goes off. One of the guards injures Shari. Meanwhile, a portal to the ship opens. Daniel takes his beloved and jumps into the portal, while the guard who opened it appears in Professor's place and attacks the colonel. Daniel furtively brings his spouse to Ra's sarcophagus. While the colonel gets a hard beating from the guard, Daniel manages to heal his spouse. Trying to get away from the ship, he runs to the portal where Ra finds him and begins to fry his brains to a crisp with the help of a microwave built into his arm. In the meantime, during the fight with the Guardian, the Colonel activates the portal with the device on his opponent's arm. Give my regards to King Tut, asshole. The portal cuts off the Guardian's head, and Daniel with his wife goes down into the pyramid. They have lost a lot of time because of the fight, and O'Neill tries to disable the detonator timer. But apparently Ra has made his own changes to the device, and the deactivator doesn't work. At this time, the remaining military men and children are taken at gunpoint by stormtroopers. But the Elder appears on the horizon with the rest of inhabitants. They rush at the enslavers with grub axes and sticks. At the sight of this, Ra realizes that his authority is finally undermined and the situation on Earth repeats itself on this planet. So he packs up his belongings and hastily leaves the long-occupied place. 
The colonel and the scientist are puzzled over how to deactivate the bomb. They come up with an idea to teleport it to Ra's ship, which at that moment has so conveniently left the atmosphere of the planet. With the help of the remote control on the dead guardian's arm, they successfully carry out their plan. At the sight of the bomb aboard, Ra manages to take his true form before the death. The colonel and the rest of the soldiers say goodbye to Daniel, who has decided to stay on this planet with his wife. He asks O'Neill to give the medallion to Catherine. Tell Catherine this brought me luck. I will. The friends say their goodbyes and all the military men return to Earth. This was my recap of the Stargate movie. Once upon a time as a child, I was very strongly impressed by it, so I couldn't help but share this masterpiece with you, my dear friends. You can always find the title and detailed information about the movie in the video description.